Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. You join me here in the war room for perhaps the last time. Yes, I'm finally making the move to uh, Philly, so do bear with me over the next couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, quick announcement before we get into today's video. But yeah, uh, over the next couple of weeks, videos will be sporadic as I'm doing the big move. As you guys know, if you've seen the, the behind the scenes video I did before Christmas where I shared with you how I conceptualize and film those intricate intros, you know, those take time. So the tabletop reviews will return, uh, fear not. In the meantime, I will continue doing the lifestyle reviews with my colleagues at uh, Watchbox, of course. And hopefully if I have time in amongst this chaotic, it's honestly, moving from state to state is a logistical nightmare. Do a quick wristwatch here. I'm wearing the Cosmonaut because, as promised, donkeys ago, and I do apologize, it has taken so long, uh, but I promised you uh, a 10 alternatives to uh, space going watches that are not the Speedmaster. So I'm gonna cover that uh, today. Without further ado, let's roll the intro and get in to the day's video. So at number 10, where better to start than the first watch ever to leave Earth's atmosphere? The first watch to do so was on the wrist of Yuri Gagarin, who was the first to venture into the unknown on April 12, 1961. There is, however, much disagreement over the uh, actual uh, model of watch Gagarin wore, and sadly, we may never know, as he died tragically in 1968 by crashing a MiG-15 jet he was piloting. The most likely contender is the Stomansky. Uh, this was a Soviet brand created in 1941, but it was not available to the public at the time, and Gagarin and his fellow pilots were issued them after graduating the Air Force Pilot School. The brand is still available today, and also now for non-pilots. This is a Swiss-Russian partnership and mainly produced in Switzerland. Another possibility is uh, supposedly a Rodina, a claim that still is supported by many collectors. To confuse matters further, uh, the Moscow Museum of Cosmonauts claims it's another Russian brand called Pabiba, uh, which is Russian for victory, a brand name apparently chosen by Stalin himself. Nine. Ignition sequence five. So at number nine, after the confusion of the first watch worn in space, let's focus on one that definitely made it out there. Uh, this watch was worn in actual open space, and this was the white-faced Strela, which is Russian for arrow. Uh, and this time it was on the wrist of cosmonaut Alexei Lenyov. This occurred when he left the spacecraft on the 18th of March, 1965, for the first ever spacewalk in a spacesuit. This brand had originally been issued to Soviet pilots in the 50s and had become the standard cosmonaut timepiece until 1979. Today, um, Strela has been reborn as a German brand based in uh, Munich and still makes the faithful modern versions of this watch. The Strela Arrow was a chronograph with a wonderfully well-balanced bicompax layout, concentric scales and minute tracks in a 37mm size. Inside was a manually wound column wheel Russian-made caliber 3017 that could record up to 45 minutes. These are now available in many different sizes and are one of the most affordable uh, mechanical space-going chronographs you can buy on the market. Sound suppression water system activated. At number eight, we have a watch previously reviewed from uh, my favorite brand. It is, of course, the Seiko 6139. Uh, this was not only the first Seiko in space, but it was also the first known automatic chronograph in space. It was worn by the American astronaut William R. Pogue, uh, he was the pilot of Skylab 4. This was the uh, third and final manned visit uh, to the Skylab orbital workstation in 1973. Uh, his tour of duty was the longest to that date, uh, lasting an incredible 84 days until his return in February 1974. 
The watch he wore is now so synonymous with him, it's uh, commonly known as the Seiko Pogue. The Pogue is instantly recognizable for its deep, rich golden dial and, and bright Pepsi bezel. It has a very distinctive but typical 70s style to the case. It features a day-date complication, uh, a 30-minute register, as well as an inner rotating bezel uh, that is operated by the crown. These days, they fetch quite a premium for an original condition example and really exemplify Seiko's lovable, daring, yet eccentric style. Start seven. At seven, we have a Zin. Yep, the Germans made it to uh, space as well. This is, of course, the renowned aviation brand, um, famous for their unpretentious, clean designs and exceptional quality. So in 1985, the German cosmonaut Reinhard Führer uh, patriotically wore his Zin 142 on his flight uh, aboard the space shuttle Challenger before it was tragically lost with all hands in January of the following year. The original was powered by the legendary automatic Le Mania uh, 5100 with that very particular layout, day-date complication and that extra jet hand that um, is just so endearing on the main dial to display the minutes of the chronograph. Uh, it has the very same movement in my Fortis uh, Cosmonaut, coincidentally. It had a um, tough, toolish look that uh, Zin do so well with a tonneau-shaped case. Since its discontinuation, Zin went on to make a modern version with a bead-blasted finish. And after 2005, uh, the anniversary, of course, they switched to a Valjoux 7750-based calibers. And then finally, um, we, uh, with the Dubuis de Poix, uh, 2070 movement which is based on the ETA uh, 2892 which is of course modular ignition sequence start six. number six we have uh, the first of two Belova watches uh, first there was the famous pre-quartz technology of the early 60s known as Accutron which um, you know I'm a, a very big fan of this revolutionary American developed technology by the Swiss inventor Max uh, Hetzel uh, utilized a 360 hertz tuning fork instead of the traditional balance wheel as a timekeeping element. And this was in the 214 movement. This pioneering, well, we got to remember for the time it was revolutionary. It had this remarkable humming and ultra smooth sweeping uh, electronic oscillator that was also used as timing components in spy satellites. A special purpose Accutron astronaut uh, was um, released. This was the watch for pilots of the CIA, in particular the A-12 spy plane surveillance missions of the Cold War, codenamed Project Oxcart. These long distance, ultra high altitude missions flew twice the normal height of commercial planes. Um, though the Actron had originally been designed as a consumer product, the construction and, and the uh, mechanism um, did very, very well in low inertia. Uh, and um, certain components gave it an excellent resistance to um, uh, G loads, as well as the ability to withstand the dramatic temperature variations of flying at such um, altitudes that would normally render most watches inaccurate or even you know cause them to malfunction this ability to to handle extreme uh, flying conditions led it to be adopted by nasa in cockpit instruments on the panel timers for manned space missions throughout apollo and gemini programs number five we have the second uh, Belova in the list. This, of course, is the Lunar Pilot. It must be noted that Belova had been involved in a notable rivalry with Amiga watches to be selected officially. Although we all know it uh, lost to Amiga in 1971, a Belova chronograph was carried on board Apollo 15. This is the uh, fourth mission to land men on the moon. It belonged to Commander David Scott. Now we all know uh, of the men who walked on the moon wore the standard Amiga uh, Speedy officially issued by NASA. However, on Scott's second 
excursion on the moon's surface, the crystal on his Amiga watch actually popped off. And so, during his third lunar walk, he switched to his backup Bulova watch. The Tooltastic Lunar Pilot now has been reissued by the brand to much success. It also happens to look aesthetically the closest to the Speedy, um, but at a fraction of the price. In a fitting twist of fate, it has now been fitted with the latest high-performance quartz movement with the 262 frequency for unparalleled accuracy. Again, a nice little nod to the Accutron history of Bilova. Five, four. Okay, number four, we have uh, quite a surprising uh, entry, and it is, of course, Rolex. And it's a shame because I really feel Rolex don't get enough recognition for the number of space adventures it's actually been involved in. The Rolex GMT Master was not only the first Rolex in space, but almost perfectly suited to its off-world travels, thanks to the GMT function. Um, this, of course, can be used not only to indicate a secondary time zone, but if you're in space, um, you can use it to indicate day or night. Obviously, very, very useful um, in the blackness of space when, you know, you can become a little bit disorientated. Uh, this, coupled with the inherent toughness of Rolex movements and the Oyster case, makes it a fantastic choice. By now we are all familiar with its Pan Am Pilot watch roots and being the first wristwatch uh, which showed two time zones at once, uh, debuting in 1954. However, what is often forgotten is that it has been worn by four space-going astronauts and even went to the moon. The first two astronauts were James Lavelle and Frank Borman, who wore their GMTs on the 1968 Apollo 8 NASA mission. This was massively important as it was mankind's first manned attempt to actually fly to the moon and return safely. Although it didn't land, they, um, they orbited it and came home. Third astronaut was Jack Swigert, commander uh, module pilot of Apollo 13, who often wore a Rolex GMT Master reference uh, 1675. Uh, and while Swigert also wore his uh, issued Amiga Speedmaster on the exterior of his space suit, um, as seen in many photos. The evidence is undeniable because he also took a Rolex GMT Master uh, during his travels to the moon and back. And we can tell because there are also f uh, photographs of him wearing it uh, before and after the mission. The fourth astronaut is Edgar Mitchell, who wore his own GMT Master during his EVA, the 1972 Apollo 14 mission. There are also photos of Mitchell in a lunar module wearing the Rolex GMT Master and the um, requisite Speedy. Three, all engine running. Okay, number three is Fortis, a massively, massively underrated brand um, and I, and actually at times I've called them the most underrated watch brand in the world I I really do believe that uh, on more than one occasion and it's true because their history is insanely rich and important and despite the recent financial troubles they still remain independent and uh, are now under new uh, ownership uh, which is just fantastic because I really want to see them succeed more. Anyway, their connection with space goes all the way back as far as 1962, when their Spacematic Automatic was constructed to hold up in extreme conditions and temperature changes. Uh, the watch was tested by seven members of the uh, US space missions. Uh, however, they didn't make it into space until 1997, when they were officially worn by the German-Russian space mission Mir 97. But since 1994, they have been officially certified as the maker of watches for the Russian Federal Space Agency, making them one of the watch brands that has been worn in space for the longest duration of time, especially on the International Space Station. Unlike the Speedy, Fortis were purposely built, tested, and deliberately made for space. Uh, I was lucky enough to um, see one of their watches that actually went into space with the Lemania 5100 caliber. This was the 38 millimeter chronograph when I visited their factory in Switzerland. And I was so inspired as soon as I got back 
uh, you guys probably know the story by now I I searched eBay and um, I actually ended up buying several uh, for myself and they've become the pride of my collection they really have They're just amazing amazing watches anyway since the 90s they uh, have redesigned the official cosmonaut chronographs many times over improving and expanding the range into some of the toughest mechanical chronographs on the market. They almost seem over-engineered for life on Earth's uh, surface, but make for some of the coolest quality Swiss-made chronographs um, you can buy, and at very fair prices too. They're very unpretentious, uh, cleanly um, and tastefully done. They really take no prisoners when it comes to um, reliability. And I've reviewed several of them on the channel, so have a look back. Um, but their legacy with space continues as Fortis are now the official maker of the Amadi 18 watches, which are designed for the future manned missions to Mars. Two. Lift off. Okay, at number two, when you absolutely positively got to outlast every watch in the room, except no substitute, it is of course G-Shock. As you guys know, I'm a massive G-Shock fan, and something we all love about them is exactly what inventor Kiko Aibe originally intended them to do, and that is to be bloody tough. Kiko Aibe wanted a watch that could have a 10-year battery life, a resistance to um, 10 bar, and survive uh, the fall from 10 feet. In 1983, uh, after destroying hundreds of prototypes and years of development, the Gravity Shock, or the G-Shock, was born. It's gone on to serve in battlefields, survive the most extreme of sports, become a fashion icon, a movie star, and of course, inevitably, it conquered space too. Uh, the famous G-Shock Square of the 80s, and my personal favorite, has been seen worn in space so many times by so many, it's almost impossible to definitively say by how many and for how long. Um, so I'll just leave you with um, some images. But the evidence speaks for itself, uh, and G-Shock became officially NASA approved, uh, and that list uh, of, of brands is very very small but the best thing is so is the price uh, the classic ultra utilitarian DW5600E like mine only starts at 40 to 50 bucks absolutely outstanding so is it any wonder that uh, the watch went on to uh, break Guinness World Records and has even had a 24.9 ton truck driven over it um, and also this was um, the same reference as mine. So as you would imagine, perfect for the um, harsh conditions of outer space. In 2017, um, they proved their toughness once again by being attached to a high altitude balloon along with a camera. And this was the GPW2000 Gravity Master. It spent one hour and 22 minutes in space at 25 kilometers past the Armstrong limit, uh, which is the outer limit where human survival and, and you know, it becomes <laughs> a bit tricky, blood begins to boil, etc. It survived temperatures of minus 58 degrees Celsius, uh, and its ultimate final height uh, was, I think, about 44.1 kilometers above the Earth. Absolutely astounding. Zero. Lift off. We have a lift off. Okay, number one. Well, it's of course my favorite. And it can only be the specially created space going version of the Navi Timer. The Breitling Navi Timer is my favorite chronograph of all time. Uh, and it was there at the very beginning of manned space travel, long before NASA had even looked at officially endorsing the Speedy. Uh, to me, the Navi Timer is the icon of icons, predating the Rolex Sub and the Amiga Speedmaster by um, first debuting in 1952. But a little later, after its inception, in 1961, Breitling actually registered the name Cosmonaut with the Swiss uh, Office of, of Intellectual Property. Uh, they took their already legendary pilot chronograph uh, with the famous for its slide rule 
the uh, 806 NaviTime and modified it with a special 24-hour dial. Like the Fortis, the Rolex GMT and the G-Shock, knowing 24-hour time in space is essential. Apart from the 24-hour gearing, the movement was the same Venus Caliber 178 as you'd find in your 12-hour NaviTimer of the time. In the following year, astronaut Scott Carpenter eventually received his own 24-hour Breitling. Um, he was a big fan of the brand, being a former pilot. He adored the innovative uh, sliding scale, and so in 1962, Carpenter orbited the Earth over three times uh, in a flight lasting just under five hours on the Mercury Atlas 7 mission, uh, culminating in a splashdown in the Atlantic, approximately 1,000 miles southeast of Cape Canaveral. Unfortunately, during his recovery, Carpenter's um, arm was submerged into water, and this damaged the non-waterproof watch, uh, which was I believe examined afterwards by NASA experts and then sent off to the Breitling company. Uh, the historic watch has never returned and sadly its whereabouts are completely unknown. However, the legend was born. NASA astronaut John Glenn, who was the first to orbit the Earth only a few months earlier, wore a modified pocket watch by Hoyer, making the Breitling perhaps the first true space-going custom-made wristwatch for the American side of the space race. The ultra-busy looking cosmonaut has remained largely unchanged over its 50-plus uh, year existence and being predominantly Le Mania based for most of that time up until the late 90s and this is something I very much appreciate about mine. Uh, my particular model is one of the very last manually wound Le Mania based um, cosmonauts and then inevitably we saw everything go big and blingy for the brand and things uh, kind of changed but its history is just as rich as the previously discussed regular Navitimer history that I've done many videos on so enjoy those have a look at that I think it really is the most underrated space watch in my opinion and while the 24-hour dial does require some getting used to its coolness and X factor is unquestionable okay guys so I'm gonna leave it there it's goodbye from the old war room hopefully I'll see you soon in a new war room in Philadelphia please don't forget to add your comments thoughts opinions all the rest of it down below and also your favorite space going watches. Of course, I can't include all of them. There's only 10 spaces available and it was in order of my personal preference. So don't worry, do share yours as well. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always guys, I will catch you hopefully in Philadelphia in the next one. Okay, ciao. Now, before I go guys, I just want to quickly tell you about this extremely cool app that Watchbox have launched. This is my own personal go-to app for everything watch related. Using the app, you can keep track of the real-time value of your watch collection. You can store watches in your digital watch box and even try on watches using an augmented reality. So don't miss out and please go to the App Store and download it today. You can access all of my latest videos right there in the app itself. And if you haven't already, please follow me on the official Urban Gentry Instagram and of course the Facebook UGWC. But most importantly of all, keep it positive, onwards and upwards.